All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike Little. I'm the mayor for the District of North Vancouver, and the pleasure falls to me to welcome everyone here. Uh, this is our community's house. We are all guests in it here to serve our community. This is the regular meeting of council for Monday, August 4th at 7 o'clock, being held uh, both uh, virtually and hybrid fashion. So members of council, staff, and members of the public are welcome to attend either in person here in the council chamber or through virtual means uh, through the Zoom uh, links that have been provided. Uh, I will just say that we are a uh, mask friendly community and so uh, while it is not required, uh, people while they're in this space are absolutely welcome to uh, wear a mask if it makes them more comfortable. At this point, uh, Council, I'm going to be seeking your support for agenda. The, er the agenda has been circulated. Are there any errors or omissions from the agenda as presented? Hearing none, will someone please move the adoption of the agenda? So moved. Moved by Councillor Back, second by Councillor Hanson. Call the question on the matter. All those in favour? Contrary minded, motion carries. Uh, Council, we do have two sets of minutes that have been circulated uh, as part of this evening's meeting. Uh, one from the uh, regular meeting of Council from February 28th and one from the regular, sorry, from the public meeting held on March 8th. Are there any errors or omissions from those meeting minutes as presented? Hearing none, will someone move adoption of the meeting minutes? So moved. Moved by Councillor Back, second by Councillor Kern. We're going to call the question on the motion. All those in favor? Contrary minded, motion carries. Okay, tonight uh, at the beginning of every meeting, uh, regular meeting of council, we set aside a period of time of up to 30 minutes to hear comments from the community uh, through public input, uh, where each speaker has an opportunity but the three minutes to address the council on matters of interest to them. Priority is given to speakers who are speaking on agenda items. And we have one speaker signed up to speak to an agenda item tonight, and we have five speakers signed up to speak to non-agenda items. If everybody sticks to the three minutes, we can typically get through up to 10 speakers in that time. And so uh, once we've gone through the six that are signed up, I'm gonna open up the opportunity for anybody else who'd like to add their name to the list, uh, either virtually or in person as well. But at this point, I'm going to uh, call up and welcome uh, Peter Teven as the first speaker in public input. Uh, with the second speaker, uh, Jessica Krasik, uh, following up uh, after that. Um, Mr. Stephen, welcome. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, for the record, uh, Peter Tevan, 1900 block, Indian River Crescent. Uh, thank you, Your Worship Council. I want to address the uh, agenda item 8.6, which is the proposed amendments to the Council Ethics Code. And uh, I, I'm neither for nor against what is in the report, um, mostly because I have to tell you, I had a little trouble understanding the format of the report. So uh, that, that's the first thing I wanna tell you about is, I didn't see any sidebar comments to say, this is the proposed amendment and this is already existing. So it was kind of hard to follow. There was uh, copies of um, the uh, sub uh, policies that I believe are um, revoked under the proposed changes, but there is no indication on that to say this will be, you know, uh, repealed. So it was a little bit hard to understand. Um, but as you will all know from previous meetings, I take a great interest in ethical uh, issues, including, you know, with my friend Councillor Hansen, particular interest in conflicts of interest and making sure that the public have a high degree of trust in our municipality, our municipal government, and this council. Um, one of the things I wanna comment on is I believe that there, there's a very much a moving nature to all of this. You know, we had a, a really uh, large change in the electoral, local uh, electoral finance laws just up to the 2018 election. Don't think that the average citizen says that we've got there yet. And so I think we can expect more changes, but nevertheless, We've been working on this inside this council for three and a half years and have yet to enact a change that was in response to that 2017 change in legislation. So I urge you to, to um, you know, go faster on this kind of stuff. Uh, I also want to comment of the 16 sections of the code, I highlighted 10 of them as being either questionable or perhaps problematic. And, and I think that's an indication that you know, we could do some more work on this. Um, the, um, the other thing that I would say is that, you know, our logic and our legal precedents 
will tell us that the adherence to this code should be higher on the part of elected officials. But what I'm actually seeing in practice over the last three and a half years is a higher expectation on the part of the public. As a member of the public who comes frequently before this committee, I can tell you there's a lot of times that I wish, uh, and I'll put it in figurative terms, that the council would bring council members themselves into greater control and adherence to the code. Um, you know, we can certainly, you're welcome to engage with me to, to find out what I'm talking about there, but there's a number of times I see that we go outside of this. Um, I don't think I've got any more time, but I have a lot more to offer on this. So perhaps I'll write to you or encourage you to reach out to me for conversation. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Thieman. Next one is uh, Jessica Kratchik, followed by uh, John Lesso. Welcome. We have uh, three minutes to address the council. Okay. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council members, for having me speak today. I'm here because of um, an incident that happened on the Spirit Trail from the 1100 block on Welch to Pemberton outside of the Van Lena Dance School. I'm a parent of a dancer there, and that's why I'm accessing that part of the Spirit Trail. A very aggressive bike rider violently came towards me and my eight-year-old daughter and yelled at us to get off the bike path. Now, the Spirit Trail is not a bike path. It is a multi-purpose path for shared users. And this is a problem because there's more than one bike rider out there that feels like this is just for them. So I did circulate notes. Um, and so I really want council to focus on slowing down the bike riders, e-scooters, e-bike riders um, in this area. I wrote to council on behalf of the greater good of that area in April of 2021. There was a file number given to this and nothing has happened. Then during spring break, I was a victim of an of, um, a unpleasant situation with a bike rider there. The situation persists to be dangerous. It's escalating. There are more e-scooters, more bike riders going faster than ever before and more users using this path. Um, at the start of the path um, from Lloyd at first, there's a sign that says, you've got to pick a side, fast bike riders over here and slow on this side. It's a picture of slow side is mom with baby buggy, person walking a dog and a little child with training wheels. These are not the users of the path anymore. There are slow signs, they're not working. There's yield to pedestrians, it's not working. I'd like to ask council to very strongly and the transportation department or the engineering department to consider putting um, baffles in. I'm sorry, that's not a very big picture, but this here is the Van Lena Dance Academy over here. Just adjust it so that it zooms in just a smidge if we can. Uh, yes. Okay, so this is the roundabout of Welch Street. Yeah. And this little driveway here is where parents are pulling in. I suggest that this becomes a baffle and this because there's east and west bike traffic and just wheeled vehicle traffic in general. Over here, there's a lane. There have been accidents where bicycles have ridden into the side of vehicles at this spot. So I suggest that there's a baffle put here and a baffle put here. This is both for pedestrians, vehicles, and motorized and bicycle safety. This is the spot where it's suggested fast people come down here on first and slow riders continue up here on the spirit trail. And I'm gonna slide over here to the other side of um, Pemberton. There are baffles here. They are yellow, they're bright and they say slow. Okay. Three minutes. Thank you very much. If you have that printed out and you want to leave it, just put it in the tray there and we'll make sure that gets copied and circulated to the council as well. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Our next speaker I have is John Lesso, followed by Michael Anderson. Welcome. You have three minutes to address the council. Good evening, Your Worship, members of council. 
My name is John Russell. I'm a resident of the District of North Vancouver. I wish to comment tonight on a continuing problem on West 15th Street between Lloyd and Pemberton. This problem has gone from bad to worse, primarily because of the actions of one irresponsible business owner at Van Wonder Auto Services, 1141 West 15th. This situation has been aggravated by the failure of the district to enforce parking regulations which have severely impacted the business at the Computer Guys store at 1130 West 15th Street, just across from Van Wonder, <clears throat> as well as businesses on other sides of 15th between Lloyd and Pemberton. I'm basing these comments on my actual experience while patronizing these businesses on numerous occasions over the past months, particularly Pemberton Auto and the Computer Guy Store. The Computer Guy Store is a single person proprietorship whose owner, Mark Smith, comes into work in the early morning around 5.30 to open his business. It's a drive in, drop off and drive out business. It's only requirement for parking is for the owner to park his vehicle and short term parking for drop offs and pickups. As has been documented by Mr. Smith on numerous occasions, as recently as Saturday, April 2nd, the parking spaces in front of his business are filled up and down the street by vehicles owned by Van Wonder, who has made it a practice to use these parking spaces to store his fleet of private vehicles of approximately 10 cars and trucks on the street overnight without penalty for weeks and months at a time. This makes it impossible for others to use these scarce parking spaces, including aero equipment rentals, who had to move to another area three months ago and their business, which is right next to Computer Guys at 1132 West 15th, is still closed and vacant. I'd like to know how many of you would like to come into work at 5.30 in the morning when it's dark and likely raining to find all the parking slots in the vicinity of your door are blocked by these Van Wonder vehicles. You and your traffic enforcement personnel have repeatedly said that there is nothing that can be done other than to issue a ticket, which Van Wonder apparently considers a cost of doing business. But that is not true. Much more can be done. For starters, prohibit this overnight parking of any vehicles on the north side of 15th between Pemberton and Lloyd. If these vehicles owned by Van Wonder continue to block the parking spaces on the north side of 15th, as they have been doing for months now, tow them. I repeat, tow these vehicles, send a message to scofflaws like Van Wonder that he cannot get away with storing his private vehicles without penalty. Thank you. Next speaker I have is Michael Anderson, followed by Cecilia McLaren. Well, Anderson, welcome. You have three minutes to address the council. Oh, you have a presentation? PowerPoint, where does it go? But yeah, just if you sit down, yep. uh, on your lower right, you'll see uh, attached to the width, you'll see the computer. Yeah. Box there, just hold it in. Okay. And you know how to navigate that? Is auto? Yeah, is your PowerPoint on here? Yeah, it should be on, should find your drive, it should be there. Okay. Which one it is? Okay, hang on. Sorry about this. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna. There you go. All right. Good evening. My name is Michael Anderson, president of the North Shore Tennis Society. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening about our concerns regarding council's unannounced decision to repurpose tennis courts to create yet more pickleball courts. We are to present to you our numbers for tennis and pickleball nationally and in the district of North Vancouver and ask that they be considered by staff, mayor, and council. These numbers parallel our previous two written communications to mayor and council. And we want to record our disappointment to have received no written reply to either letter. Let's look at the facts. In our meetings, 
we have heard that pickleball is more popular than tennis. But with four and a half million players, tennis is the eighth largest sport in Canada. Independent national studies show that 12% of Canadians play tennis compared to less than 1% who play pickleball. In the district, that means there are more than 10,500 tennis players compared to 826 pickleball players. Let's look at the North Shore Pickle Club's own membership. In 2019, they had 483 members. Today, three years later, they, have, they say they hope to have 500 members, but at their last meeting, they report that as of January 31st, 2022, they had just 20, 277 members for 2022. Only 53% or 265 of their members are district residents. Hardly rapid growth or indic indicative of the need for yet more courts. Vancouver-based pickleball players used to cross the bridge to play on North Vancouver courts. However, with that community recently opening pickleball courts, Vancouver's demand to play on district courts will be reduced. A new organization, the Mountain View Pickleball Club, is currently recruiting players from off the North Shore. To us, this indicates a lack of pickleball players, not courts. But now let's look at the public outdoor courts in the district. We've been told there's a deficit of outdoor pickleball courts here, but the numbers show the exact opposite. There are currently 46 outdoor tennis courts and seven outdoor pickleball courts here. That means there is one court for every 234 tennis players compared to one pickleball court for every 118 pickleball players. That's double the number of pickleball courts per player than for tennis. It's not a per capita situation, it's a per player situation. That's why we have to make decisions based on that. Council's decision to reallocate five tennis courts to pickleball will result in a net increase of 10 new pickleball courts or up to 20 if four courts are created on each demolished court. The impact of courts is to widen the per player deficit to one tennis court for every 262 players compared to one pickleball court for 46 players, a result which defies all logic. Thus, we ask publicly, respectfully, that you set aside your decisions to close Little Tate's Institute Road and Neverland Park tennis courts for conversion to pickleball until a realistic, credible needs and impacts assessment can be conducted and shared. We want that to be done publicly. We ask that you find the optimal solution working with both tennis and pickleball and the effective communities to build new pickleball courts if demand and the numbers show they are needed. Remember also pickleball needs hubs in areas away from residential housing. That is the joint recommendation of Pickleball BC and Tennis BC. Thank you. Together, let's rally for tennis. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll leave uh, my leave it here. Thank you, Michael Anderson. Next speaker is Cecilia McLaren. I'm just gonna help her with the sure. Okay. Welcome. You have uh, three minutes to address the council. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Cecilia McLaren. I reside at 4312 Cliffmont Road in Deep Cove. I am vice president of the North Shore Tennis Society and a resident of the district of North Vancouver, in particular Deep Cove for the past 50 years. I'm also the vice president of the Deep Cove Tennis Club of which I'm a founding member and vice president of STANS, the Seniors Tennis Association of the North Shore. I've played since I was three actually, and I'm now 77. That's not in here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening about our concerns regarding Council's decision to repurpose tennis courts to create more pickleball courts. We have made two prior written submissions to Council and met with the Mayor and several Councillors to discuss this matter. In our submissions and meetings, we have repeatedly requested copies of Council's decision to convert courts both the original decision in September 21 and the amended version last month, as well as the needs analysis and data supporting these decisions. Unfortunately, our requests have been ignored. We have explained and we explain to you now that Council's decision will have a devastating impact on the tennis community, that we have suggested alternative solutions to meet the needs of both sports without harming the tennis community. Our approach has been consistent with the joint recommendation of Pickleball BC and Tennis BC, 
However, these concerns and suggestions have also been ignored. Regrettably, it appears that Council's decision to repurpose tennis courts was made without any needs or impact analysis. Rather, it appears to be based on erroneous information and assumptions about the size, makeup, and needs of the tennis and pickleball communities. We agree that pickleball players need and deserve courts to play on. I'm here to tell you there is a better way. When we last appeared before Council, we expressed our desire to reinvigorate our historically collaborative relationship, and we emphasized our willingness to work together to find solutions that meet the needs of both sports without harming the tennis community. To those of you who took the time to meet or speak with us personally, we thank you. We believe that you genuinely want to reach the right decision without harming the tennis community and creating division among fellow citizens. Some of you are now questioning the information you are being supplied with, but we want to be clear. We believe that major decisions like this should be made in an open and transparent way with a public record and they should be supported by facts and evidence, not erroneous information and assumptions. We are here to say that we believe staff's process to make recommendations to you in this matter have been procedurally flawed and their responses to complaints somewhat misleading. Thank you, Your Worship, Councillors. The legacy of tennis is now before us. Built by past leaders, both civic and community, that legacy rests in your hands. Thank you. I Thank didn't you. quite finish, but it's in here. Thank you, Cecilia McLaren. Yes, and if you drop it in the tray, we'll make sure that it's scanned and cir circulated to council as well. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker I have is Gloria Anderson. Welcome. Hello. You have uh, three minutes to address the council. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for listening. Um, I'm Gloria Anderson, president of the Seniors Tennis Association of the North Shore, affectionately known as STANS. STANS was formed in 1988, when at that time a group of senior tennis players established the organization with the purpose of promoting active participation of seniors tennis players who did not have partners, opponents, facilities, or club affiliations. In the early days, Stans was the driving force behind the creation of the North Vancouver Tennis Centre. And over the past 34 years, the good work of Stans has touched many seniors on the North Shore. Stans has continued to enhance enjoyment of life and extend tennis participation of active seniors tennis players. Across the North Shore, many of our most active players are in their 60s, 70s, and even their 80s. Their preferred sport is tennis. It is affordable, safe, inclusive, provides ex exercise, fresh air, community, and laughter. It increases life expectancy. Studies show that tennis players had 50%, 56% lower risk of dying of heart disease and stroke and can extend your life by 9.7 years. <laughs> We are grateful to the North Shore municipalities for their generous support, allowing us reserved access to public tennis courts, including, including Myrtle, Fraser, Cloverly, Delbrook, Little Cates Parks in North Vancouver, and Ambleside and Benbow in West Van. Unfortunately, we've only granted, been granted assigned courts at Myrtle, Fraser, and Cloverly this year. This is very disappointing for the stands members who live in the Seymour area. For many years, Stans has had a permit to play at designated hours at Little Kate's Park. And now, because of the district's decision to reallocate half of Little Kate's courts to pickleball, the Parks Department has not renewed our permit. We were not informed or consulted about this decision. We've been told that the pickleball players have to use these courts because of their proximity to parking and washrooms. We can inform you that tennis players also drive and use the washroom. On behalf of the tennis players of North Vancouver, we are asking council to reverse this decision and if pickleball courts are needed, build them in a way that does not harm the tennis community, especially our seniors players. I have heard that some councillors believe that tennis is a young person's sport and that most pickleball players are seniors. Nothing could be further from the truth. An independent national study on tennis participation found that 13% of tennis players are seniors. 
When the two tennis courts at Murdo Fraser became dedicated pickleball courts, it became very noisy and distracting for tennis players playing on the closest courts to these courts. We are not happy about council's decision to reallocate tennis courts to pickleball. Of course, we support the creation of dedicated pickleball courts. And we agree with Tennis BC and Pickleball BC that this should not harm the community and absolutely support the creation of dedicated pickleball courts. Yeah, I have you draw the report. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I see one attendee has raised their hand. I have Hazen Colbert uh, as a virtual attendee has raised his hand to speak. We make sure that Mr. Colbert can move over to the meeting. And so we still have some time left on the public input period at the front end of the meeting. If anyone else would like to uh, to uh, add their name to the list, uh, at virtual attendees can raise their virtual hand and the clerk's department will move them over. But as also people who are here in the audience can. And so just uh, double checking, Hazen Colbert, can you hear me? <clears throat> they might just be still transferring over. already done, but I have to do it a second. Oh, there we go. Can you, can you hear yes, me? I can hear you, Mr. Colbert. Welcome. You have three minutes to address the council. I deeply regret there's a serious, serious issue that we have to deal with here in the District of North Vancouver. If we don't successfully deal with it, it could result in the, the end of the District of North Vancouver. It might actually result in the end of humanity as we know it. And of course, because of this, uh, there are people other than me that believe that all of the resources of the District of North Vancouver, including this council, and including all of the time available for public input, should be dedicated to this matter. This issue, which now actually has priority over such things as climate change and the war in the Ukraine and COVID, Canadian inflation. This issue is the distribution of tennis courts between people that play tennis and people that play pickleball or some sort of thing. They, I don't know what it is. On both sides of the debate, people claim that this is a sport. I have news for you. Neither tennis nor pickleball are sports in the same way that neither poker or car racing our sports. I will also tell you there are claims made about this huge number of people in Canada that play tennis. In fact, the research shows that the average income of a person that plays tennis in Canada is $100,000 and that 97% of them are Caucasians of European heritage. I would call tennis nothing more than a pastime for the Euro trash. In this country, just just a minute. In the country, not in the District of North Vancouver. I have no I have no data for the District of North Vancouver. I'm only relying on the country. Thank you, Mary Little. Thank you for uh, understanding. I don't doubt for a minute that unless we address this issue, unless all of the resources of the District of North Vancouver are put forward, there might be the breakdown of society in the District of North Vancouver. Can one just imagine? If all of those seniors with one foot in the grave can't get out and play picketball in Kate's Park, or sorry, uh, play tennis. Now I wanna tell you that Kate's Park is at the end of a trail in which I walk my dog, and which I've walked dogs for 13 years. Over those 13 years, less than 30% of my time have I ever seen anybody at Little Kate's Park doing anything. So the suggestion that there's a conflict at Little Cage Park is, well, we'll call this the effluent that flows from the back end of a bull. Let's put an end to the stupidity. We have more important things to take care of. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colbert. Hey, I haven't seen any other virtual hands raised. Uh, oh, I have one in here in the audience. Come on up. Welcome, Juan Palacio. Welcome, and uh, you have three minutes to address the council. Hello, Your Worship, 
and members of the council. I am not here to speak about tennis or pickleball. Um, I wanted to speak regarding uh, something that is an issue I've seen and recently is exemplified by what's happening in the city of North Van with uh, the skateboarding community. A lot of them are upset because they did not receive enough information about the skate park and any of that, but there actually were signs put up, but they didn't uh, have enough links to websites or to the information. I wanted to suggest that the district make it a standard that any sort of public notice have a website and a QR code, the, the blocks with the scans, because it has now been shown that people are too lazy to type in uh, full website addresses and are way more likely to actually put in trust if there's a QR code. Uh, so yeah, I wanted you guys to consider that, just putting QR codes on everything. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Worship and members of the council. You know, further speakers at this time, and so complete the public input period. I will just say, in response to one of the comments there, that uh, seemed to suggest people shouldn't feel welcome to be able to share their concerns, or that this concern is more important than that concern. Therefore, we shouldn't hear about um, these concerns. This is an opportunity for everybody to tell uh, tell the council what's important to them. Uh, the it can be uh, small matters, large matters, international matters, very localized matters. It doesn't matter. It's a it's a public input opportunity for people, and they get to share what is important to them. Which sometimes is a bit off the beaten path, and sometimes it's uh, it's really part of the the broader co conversation in the community. But uh, um, it is uh, people are welcome to present uh, whatever topic they so choose uh, in our in our public input period. And uh, I want to thank everybody for participating in today's uh, public input period. Uh, we've completed the list, and so I'm going to move on with the uh, agenda. I'm going to request that the clerk's department uh, welcome all of the participants of the Heritage Awards and the Design Awards in so that they can see all of the other participants in the virtual system. That's what we're going to be dealing with next. Probably want to make sure that uh, Kevin Jang, Jason Smith, and Jessica Lee can be uh, uh, spotlighted on the video as well. Uh, so people uh, who are listed as attendees, you may see a pop up telling you to become a panelist. What that's just going to do is allow you to see the other speakers. We found in the past it's very difficult to convey the warmth and gratitude that we want to when we're giving out awards uh, through the normal uh, system. And so in order to best replicate uh, the real life experience, uh, we're going to have uh, everybody move over to the um, uh, as, a, as a panelist so they can see all of the other people and get to hear stories about uh, the award winners and get to see them in as close to person as, as we can this evening. But it'll just take another 30 seconds. Unless the clerks have a trick to bring everybody over as a panelist. Okay, but I'm going to get going and we'll make sure that as the staff are doing their presentation, we're going to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to move over the main meeting. So tonight, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Design Excellence and Heritage Awards. Every year, we take a look back at new projects that exemplify design excellence, as well as the projects, people, and organizations that contribute to the conservation and advocacy for our communities built natural and cultural heritage. 
I very much appreciate everyone joining us tonight in this online format to celebrate some of the achievements within our community. And I hope we soon will be able to get together to celebrate these kinds of achievements in person. To begin with, uh, the award ceremony this evening, I would like to uh, hand the floor over to Mr. Kevin Zhang for the presentation of the 2021 Design Excellence Awards. Mr. Zhang, can you hear me? Uh, oh, there we go. Great. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Worship. My name is Kevin Zhang, development planner with the district and staff liaison to the advisory design panel. I'm here tonight to provide an overview of the ADP, this year's nominees, and also to announce the design excellence winners. The advisory design panel is a technical committee made up of experts in the field of architecture, landscape architecture, public art, inclusivity and accessibility, engineering, development, construction, and public safety. The panel members are all volunteers, re residents of the North Shore, and are appointed by council. The mandate of the panel is to review all major development applications against district policies, plans, design best practices, and to advise staff. But what this means on the ground is ensuring that development impacts on shadowing and views are limited. It means building materials selected are suitable and durable. On the large scale, it means resolving complex site planning issues and improving overall pedestrian experiences. And on the smaller scale, it means ensuring that accessible residents are designed to the highest accessible standards. At this point, I want to take a moment to give recognition to the panel members of 2021. Andre Zhivnevsky, Eric Ng, James Blake, Carolyn Kennedy, Nancy Paul, Don Aldersley, Sergeant Kevin Basewell, Nathan Shuttleworth, Grace Gordon Collins, Alexis Shikorn, and Rajesh Kumar. We're very lucky to have so many local professionals who volunteer their precious evenings to help shape our communities. Thank you very much. In 1992, the Design Excellence Awards program was established to recognize and promote design excellence. Over the years, we have had many exemplary projects that have made contributions to the built environment. And this year is no different. We have seven projects that achieved completion in 2021 and are nominated for Design Excellence Awards. First at Lim Valley, we have the redevelopment of Mountain Court, which are now four uh, multi-story apartment buildings located at 1241 East 27th. Second, uh, along Marine Drive corridor, we have uh, a, a four-story residential development that's located at 1616 Lloyd Avenue. Moving eastward to Lynn Creek, we have uh, 1519 Crown Street, which is a six-story residential building. The, one of the first to be uh, developed in our Lynn Creek Town Center. And close to it, uh, on the northwest uh, side of uh, Charlotte Road and Mountain Highway, we have 467 Mountain, which is a mixed-use six-story development. And this is adjacent to our upcoming community center in Lynn Creek. And fifth, we have a townhouse project at 3468 Mountain Hill Parkway, just in our Seymour neighborhood. Over to the west side of the community, we have 2070 Curling Road, which is a townhouse development that's going in the Lionsgate uh, peripheral town center there. And it, it, again, is one of the first townhouses to be completed in that area. And lastly, Inland Valley, we have the newly built Argyle Secondary School located at 1131 Frederick Road. Now with these great projects, I am happy to announce the winners. The first Design Excellence Awards is awarded to the Lloyd by Ani Development, Yamamoto Architecture, and Durant Kurek Landscape Architecture. On screen, we have a view of the south facade and the glass hallways that connect the two segments of the building. The panel specifically congratulates the design team on the use of glass, windows, and overall material selection. 
a strong presence that includes generous features such as patios, and successfully capturing the mountain theme. The second Design Excellence Award is given to Brooklyn by Wanson Development, Franco Architecture, and Grant Cork Landscape Architects. And on screen, we have uh, the photo of the building at uh, Mountain Highway and Charlotte Road, the two facades. The panel specifically congratulates the design team on the effort to create a clean corner, which provides an architectural focal point at this intersection. The amount of windows and the combination of colors used in the facade and the overall continuity of the design, which is present at street level. You can see there uh, uh, the public realm is integrated with the cycle paths that are uh, newly implemented. And the final Design Excellence Award is given to Mason by Cressy Development, Shift Architecture, and once again, Grant Kirk Landscape. They're obviously doing lots of great work in the district. The panel congratulates uh, the design team on the architectural style and use of brownstone to create an attractive streetscape and that the detailing, materials, lighting, and landscaping as well, are both well thought out and well executed. And with these three awards, uh, that concludes the 2021 Design Excellence Awards. I wanna congratulate both the winners and nominees tonight. I will now hand the floor over to Mr. Jason Smith for the Heritage Awards. Well, just, just before we go to Jason, uh, oh. uh, thank you, Kevin Zhang, for your presentation. and. Uh, uh, I want to congratulate uh, all of the award winners on behalf of the council. Uh, thank you to all of the designers uh, and groups that submitted projects and also also wanted to extend the appreciation of council to the uh, the panelists that judge the different uh, uh, projects and, and express our appreciation for sharing your time and talents to uh, to promote uh, excellence in design in our community. Uh, so on behalf of the council, thank you very much for your uh, participation. Next uh, up, we're going to have Jason Smith, who's going to be uh, presenting the staff uh, presentation on the uh, 2021 Heritage Awards. Mr. Smith, can you hear me? I can hear you. I just need uh, Kevin to stop sharing his screen so I can uh, share mine. We can uh, do that. Good point. Thank you. Great. Well, let's see that. So uh, welcome, Jason Smith. Go ahead. Thank you, I'll just. Sorry, there we go. Good evening, <clears throat> my name is Jason Smith and I'm a senior planner with the Community Planning Department and I have the pleasure to present the Community Heritage Awards for 2021. The Heritage Awards are presented each year to recognize and honor the efforts of individuals or groups involved in promoting or con and conserving heritage in the district. There are four Heritage Award categories. The first category is maintenance and restoration of residential, commercial, or public use structures. The second category is heritage advocacy. The third category is heritage landscape preservation and enhancement. And the fourth category is compatible new design in a heritage context. Heritage Award recipients are recommended by the district's Community Heritage Advisory Committee, which is comprised of volunteers with expertise or an interest in local history, architecture, building restoration, and heritage conservation. The current committee members are Anne Seville, who's the chair, Alistair Moore, James Paul, Jennifer Clay, Melanie Montgomery, Philip Baton, Rob Grisdale, and Trevor Ford. Councillor Bond is the council representative. The efforts of the Heritage Advisory Committee raise the community's awareness of heritage issues and contribute to the preservation and protection of heritage buildings. Tonight, we are presenting three awards to recognize the efforts of homeowners, volunteers, and advocates who demonstrate a commitment to heritage conservation in the district. The awards will be presented in no particular order. This Heritage Award is given to 281 West Braemar Road in recognition of the architecturally sympathetic addition and renovation, renovation to this heritage home. <clears throat> this home, known as Tori Mar, Gaelic for meadow in the mountain, and constructed in 1920, is valued for its craftsman style architectural features and original interior elements. Renovations include expansion of the kitchen, addition of exterior doors, and renovation of the roof. 
admiral effort has been undertaken regarding the choice of materials, colors, and detailing that complements the style and structure of the existing home. This award is presented to Richard Braille. The District of North Vancouver thanks Richard for his extensive and thoughtful renovation of this heritage home. The second Heritage Award is given to the Coast Salage Plant Nursery Program under the Heritage Advocacy category. Located at the Maplewood Flats Conservation Area, the nursery is an ongoing program in partnership with the Swale Tooth Nation and aims to promote cultural associations of Coast Salish plants and their importance for improving local wildlife. The nursery features a wide selection of native plants and seeds and hosts a variety of workshops and events, including plant walks and online webinars with local Indigenous ethnobotanists and regional nursery experts. All proceeds support habitat restoration and educational programming on Coast Salish culture and ecology. In 2021, the nursery sold over 5,000 plants to over 700 households and partners. It also engaged thousands of people online through webinars, social media, and newsletters. The nursery provides a unique platform for educating our community on living history and the preservation and restoration of the West Coast natural flora and fauna. This award is presented to the Wild Bird Trust of BC. This last one, but not least, uh, Heritage Award is given to the welcome figure at L'Ecole Argyle Secondary, also under the Heritage Advocacy category. The welcome figure named Kai Ak Tin was carved by Coast Salish artist Sinamkin, also known as Jody Broomfield, for, from a red cedar tree that was harvested from the Squamish Valley and donated by the Squamish Nation. The tree is estimated to be over 200 years old. A portion of the work took place on the school grounds, providing opportunities for students and staff to learn about Indigenous history and values, as well as help with painting and carving. Designed to represent the beauty of the North Shore, Kayakton stands over five meters tall with open arms to welcome individuals to the school and to protect and strengthen the school community. The welcome figure was unveiled at the newly built they call Argyle Secondary School in October. This award is presented to both to Lekal Argyle Secondary and Jody Broomfield. And that brings an end to the 2021 Heritage Awards. Congratulations to tonight's award recipients. Thank you, Jason Smith, for the presentation. Congratulations to the award recipients on behalf of the council. Uh, their, uh, the submissions are excellent. Uh, I want to thank all of the people that uh, that made extra efforts to preserve heritage, preserve and promote heritage in our community. It's something that uh, that we all value. And uh, I also wanted to uh, express my appreciation to the volunteer panelists that uh, participate uh, through our, our our heritage committee and the time and talents that they share uh, to preserve and protect and promote uh, heritage in our community as well. Uh, so on behalf of the council to everyone, thank you very much for your participation in this year's 2022, uh, uh, sorry, 2021 Design Excellence and Heritage Awards. Again, we're, we're recognizing it partway through this year, but it is for last year. Hey, thank you very much. And at this time, we're going to return to the uh, uh, regular agenda format. Council, we have uh, several um, uh, releases of closed meeting de um, decisions, uh, largely for appointments to volunteer committees in the community. Uh, so those are submitted for your consideration. Uh, also, uh, I'm going to be moving on to uh, item eight. This is reports from council or staff. Uh, I would propose uh, that we prepare a consent agenda uh, for items eight one, Eight two, eight three. All three of those are for adoption and not up for debate. And then also eight four and eight five. Those are permits to be issued. Would any member of council like to withdraw any one of those five items from a consent agenda? Sorry, your worship. Can I ask you to repeat that? I was I was bumped out as an attendee, and I'm so I missed the first part of uh, what you were saying there as far as a consent the items. Well, first, let's make sure we can get Councillor back back on as a panelist. How about we do that? I think I am. I think I am now. Okay. Uh, for a minute. Yeah. Thank you. Your uh, camera. If you can put your camera on, then we can re-spotlight you. All right. There we go. Fantastic. 
Welcome back, Councillor. <laughs> Thank you. I just missed the, the couple items. I think I think I got them, but if you could repeat them, please. Absolutely. So what I'm proposing is 8.1, uh, which is the financial plan bylaw up for adoption. 8.2, which is 1920 Glen Eyre Drive, which is up for adoption. 8.3, Canfield Crescent, also adoption. And then 8.4, which is the development permit for Glen Eyre, uh, which was pre would previously have been up for adoption. And then 8.5, which is development permit for the uh, for the uh, Canfield Crescent site. 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, 8.4, 8.5. Would any member of council like to withdraw any of those for further discussion? Okay, seeing none, that, would, that is what I would propose as a consent agenda. I'm happy to move it. Is there a seconder on the matter? Seconded by Councillor Bond. And I'll call the question. All those in favor? Contrary minded. Motion carries. Thank you very much. So, to members of the public who may still be participating in the meeting, that means that items 8.1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 have all just passed uh, by the consent of the council. The next item up for discussion tonight is item 8.6. And this is following up on a report from the Chief Administrative Officers. Just want to check. Mr. Stewart, I'm going to come to you for opening comments on the Code of Ethics Policy Update and rescinded policies. Your Worship, we uh, we revised the Code of Ethics just to bring it up to uh, modern current practices. In the last uh, time that we brought it uh, to Council, uh, there was concern that we had sort of uh, probably confused a little bit 9.3 and 9.4. And so what we've done is we've gone back and we've simplified 9.4 to reflect the legal ability that we have with respect to campaign contributions. So I, I, there's really nothing more for me to say at this point, unless council uh, has other questions. There was, a, there was a question from a member of the public about what has been rescinded or removed. Um, uh, can you characterize uh, any, any pieces from the old uh, code of ethics that are not incorporated into the new code of ethics? Your worship, we haven't removed anything from the code of ethics. The, uh, the references to rescinding the two other bylaws uh, deal with another matter that's before council. We've introduced a, an omnibus bylaw dealing with council's access to legal services. And the clerk uh, has uh, suggested that we need to actually uh, rescind the old um, policies, which go back to 1995, actually. So we're just doing a little bit of housekeeping there. That's all. Okay. And, and so the only actual addition is the clause 9.4 in the end um, uh, to this, and everything else is consolidation of the previous uh, regulations. There, uh, I see uh, Councillor Hanson, uh, your hand is up. Do you have a motion? Thank you very much. Is there a seconder for the motion? Happy to second. Okay, Councillor Hanson, your comments? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, this amendment to the Code of Ethics and the rescinding of these uh, corporate uh, policies, uh, the rescinding, of course, being, uh, as mentioned, largely housekeeping, and they'll be brought back in a new form. Uh, the amendment of the Code of Ethics includes the new paragraph 9.4, uh, which directly addresses the disclosure of campaign contributions uh, from various parties, including from developers. Uh, this is the uh, resolution of a motion I brought much earlier this term in 2019, seeking both disclosure of campaign contributions from developers and reclusal from voting by councillors where such contributions are received. This provision takes the issue as far as possible, I believe, within the existing legislative and legal framework and um, uh, calls for the uh, disclosure by, uh, by councillors of campaign contributions in excess of uh, $250. Section 9.4 encourages, it can't mandate, but it does encourage disclosure of campaign contributions exceeding $250, where an item comes before council potentially conveying a benefit to that party. And that would of course include rezoning in a case of contributions from developers. I do believe that this uh, will uh, support transparency. 
I would, of course, as other members of council, would prefer stronger measures, but these will need to involve legislative reform at a provincial level. I believe that paragraph 94, as amended of the Code of Ethics, is a step forward. And I know that since I brought uh, the motion in 2019, to the best of my knowledge, all councillors who have received campaign contributions from developers have declared these when rezonings are being sought by these developers. And I thank those councillors uh, for this transparency. So uh, with those comments, I thank the staff and everyone involved in bringing forward the amended code of ethics. And uh, I uh, am pleased to support that amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Henson. Just for my own comments, just draw people's attention to section 16 compliance and enforcement. Again, with uh, many of these matters, uh, ultimate enforcement falls with the provincial government through the courts. Um, uh, but there are elements of this that uh, are self-policed and elements of this that uh, the council reserves the right to have a, a hearing to decide on the censure of a member of council if such a, if a member comes in uh, conflict with the uh, uh, with the code of ethics and um, and the we have outlined there in in section 16 uh, what that uh, uh, review looks like and what opportunity people have to to defend themselves and so just wanted to always draw attention to how this will be enacted uh, but uh, I do think that you know, it's critically important for us to uh, maintain the confidence of our community by having high standards of uh, excellence and ethics uh, in delivery of our roles. And I hope this policy will help us achieve that. Councillor Bond, your comments? Uh, thanks, Mayor Little. Yeah, I think the, uh, the changes that have been made more clearly uh, represent the motion that Councillor Hansen brought forward, specifically around campaign contributions. I think the previous version of this that came before us a month or two ago was definitely um, more confusing. Uh, this is quite clearly states, I think, the intention of Councillor Hansen's motion. Um, you know, I think on, on that issue, we did actually have quite a good uh, discussion and debate. We had a full council workshop on, uh, on that issue. Um, and one thing I think it'll be interesting um, to see um, how this uh, how the how the public um, reacts and, and interprets this. I, I remember at the workshop and in public speakers that have presented to council, there's definitely a very strong link uh, that was made between campaign contribution campaign contributions and influence. So uh, that's been made by a number of public speakers and, and made by councillors in, in a workshop. And I think the one uh, point I think both Councillor Kern and I um, brought up at the workshop was that if people believe that uh, money, uh, whether it's a $200 donation or a $600 donation, somehow buys influence over a councillor decision, I think that's um, uh, that, uh, discredits a lot of the work that uh, elected officials do. And, you know, I think there's a lot of way, other ways that councillors can be influenced. Um, you can have a friend or a family member that lives beside a major transportation project. Um, you could have, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, residents or acquaintances that maybe live beside or even in a, a project that's being rezoned. Um, and those, those types of issues that would probably actually have more influence over uh, a councillor's decision are not brought to night light. They're not transparent. Um, and so we're going to focus a lot on uh, campaign contributions, which is, which is, which is, uh, which is appropriate. Um, but if we are talking about um, greater influences, there's still a lot of other things out there that might influence uh, a councillor's decision uh, that the public will not have transparency on. You're not going to know if uh, one of us, you know, has a have a family friend, um, maybe beside a, a road project that might be going in or a rezoning project. Um, and so I think that's, um, we'll see how that uh, is interpreted in the public. Uh, the other um, issue that brought this code of ethics uh, change uh, to council was the Luca Dellis report on the uh, pigeon bylaw. And uh, we actually haven't actually talked about the Luca Dellis report. Uh, we had the report presented to council and I remember specifically at that time, Mr. Stewart said, we can't actually talk about anything in the report. And we haven't. 
And so I'm wondering, uh, maybe Mr. Stewart specifically, uh, at that workshop, you said there would be an opportunity to talk about the Luca Dells report and the recommendations that were made in that report and how they're being implemented in district policies. And we have not. We have not had an opportunity to talk about the contents of that report, about the recommendations, uh, about the findings of fact. Um, but now I think that the uh, court cases have been cleared up, at least to the best of my knowledge. Uh, is there going to be an opportunity to talk uh, about the findings in that report? Mr. Stewart, do you have a response? Uh, you, your Worship, uh, certainly uh, council will have a number of opportunities. Uh, one is with respect to the Code of Ethics. I, I think I can divide the Luca Delos report into a number of sort of subsections. Some of, us, some of those have to be dealt with in camera because they're legal, but um, the other two, and, and the major ones, are the, the Code of Ethics, and, and secondly, uh, the whole issue around uh, how council uh, influences uh, what gets on the agenda, and, and I've got a report coming forward on that, but certainly it, it's up to council, and, and Councillor Bond is quite correct. Uh, when we were constrained by uh, the threat of legal action, it was inappropriate for council to come in on that, but uh, that legal action is now ended. And uh, so if council wishes to make a comment, uh, they can do so. I just would uh, urge you to be um, prudent about the comments that you make, lest you attract uh, more legal attention to yourself. So I wouldn't suggest that, so. Okay, um, that's it for this round, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hansen, your comments? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I just want to make it clear from my perspective that I continue to believe that the public uh, perceive, and in my view correctly, that where there are campaign contributions uh, to local government politicians by real estate developers, that it would be, in my respectful view, most appropriate, uh, not only that there was a mandatory disclosure, but also that those local government politicians did not vote on rezonings uh, that were going to bring financial benefit to those developers. My belief in that uh, matter of ethics and, dis and transparency hasn't, uh, hasn't faded. Uh, what we have encountered is um, limitations of the existing legislative framework. And for my part, I will continue to speak out on this issue and I will continue to call for legislative reform at the provincial level uh, to more clearly define the nature of a conflict and to uh, address the, the very issue of campaign contributions by developers, uh, which are then uh, lead to uh, rezoning decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kern. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just wanted to echo that I do also feel like it's important that council have an opportunity, whether that's a workshop format, to actually discuss um, everything that came out of that um, in, in a comprehensive way, rather than just kind of taking pieces of it. Um, so if that's a workshop, um, I would support that. Uh, I think that the um, talking about some of the work that needs to happen provincially, um, which is something that we can have an advocacy role in, is also a municipal ethics commissioner. Um, I, other provinces and territories have one. Um, as elected officials, there is very little recourse for um, if you have a, a problem. Um, there isn't, you're, you're basically, I think, Mary Little, you said you're, <laughs> um, you use the word policing, I would use a different word, but you are, um, it, it's all internal. So you can, you can imagine that um, that can be a quite a challenging environment for people um, to be in. So I, I think there is some, some work happening on that. And I just wanted to raise maybe council and staff's uh, awareness to that if they're not familiar with some advocacy that's happening around um, that. I think it is really important for elected officials to have um, a place to go that's outside of the organization. Um, and council because uh, I, I just think that's really important that that happen. Um, and then I think what what a lot of this is about um, is it, this is all about power. Um, and so I think without that analysis of who has power, um, how do you how do you use your power um, without a broader analysis of positionality, power privilege, um, we're we're not going to maybe seek the changes that it is going to seem like it's a performative act rather than, actually doing something substantive. So um, 
I would encourage and, and ask as part of some of the work that we're already doing, um, there's some work happening in HR on a corporate level uh, around anti-oppression um, work, anti-racism work, um, really uh, work around our inclu uh, the inclusion of, uh, sorry, the um, coalition of inclusive municipalities work that is still very much ongoing. And I do appreciate that staff is taking um, a slow approach to that because I do believe they want it to be meaningful. Um, and so we're not looking to just check off boxes, but I don't feel like we're there yet. Um, and I think that there's lots of education that council and, and senior staff could do. And so I would like to maybe hear from staff if there's an opportunity uh, for education for council and, and staff uh, and what you'd be looking for in, for in terms of direction for that to happen to really discuss um, existing power structures and systemic issues that prevent um, people from having equitable access to change in our community. So could, could staff please speak to what um, you would need in order to move forward on some education? Uh, your, your Worship, uh, we've already got a council direction on that. And as Councillor uh, Curran has mentioned, we are actually moving forward. And uh, we hope to come forward in a workshop to provide a, a, an update and a schedule of, of exactly how we're going to do that. Uh, as Councillor Curran has, has mentioned, uh, it's something that has to be uh, somewhat slow and deliberative uh, because we have to get it right uh, at the end of the day. And, and we, and we want to do that, but we recognize that we've got uh, both council direction on um, inclusion and on reconciliation. And, and we are moving forward on both those fronts. And uh, we hope to, before the summer, provide an update to council on exactly uh, uh, what it is we're doing. Thank you. Great. Uh, any other comments, council? You know, I will just say that uh, you know, this, this issue, I think it definitely was the intent of the provincial government the last time they reviewed the uh, Elections Act and, uh, and the financial reviewed the financial disclosure process. The intent was to reduce the influence of big money, we'll say, on, uh, on local government elections and also decision making. And uh, although I think there are some people that took it to mean I just can't issue the check through my business, I can still issue the check through my personal. And uh, uh, that is allowed to a cap and the courts have repeatedly over and over again defended that that does not in and of itself constitute uh, conflict of interest on the part of the elected person. But in all cases, whether it's a $10 donation, a $1,200 donation, or whether it's uh, your neighbor or somebody that you're um, uh, closely connected to in the community, there is a self-assessment process in these codes of ethics and in, in, in the legislation. The moment that we feel conflicted, that we cannot make a decision uh, uh, in the best interest of the community or specifically, at the very least, um, uh, in any other way other than a personal interest of our own, uh, then we need to step back and we need to recuse ourselves from, from discussions and decisions uh, to make sure that the integrity of the process is respected. And so in all of these cases, it's, it's about living up to the spirit of the regulations as well as um, um, meeting the letter of the law. Although, again, the ultimate hammer on much of this is uh, left to the provincial courts to decide where the line is and whether uh, uh, a reasonable action was taken. And uh, unfortunately, it probably means future um, decisions will have to be referred back to the courts for clarification from time to time until we get better clarity. Councillor Curran, your second time speaking. I just wanted to follow up on the second part of my question about um, does staff need a direction for a workshop um, specifically around that report or how would how would that be moving forward? Uh, not a specific focus tonight. No, I, I will say just on one thing on that. I don't. Um, uh, every member of council is welcome to uh, uh, Talk to the press and tell your story and and uh, talk to your neighbors. Put something out on social media that represents your views. Whether it's a workshop or whether it's your conversation in the public, you still the contents of in-camera discussions cannot be disclosed. And so the challenge with having a workshop on the matter is that it doesn't automatically disclose uh, what was um, 
a part of the in-camera discussions. And so it's still a challenge for it to be a District of North Vancouver discussion. Individual members are absolutely welcome to uh, uh, represent what they think understand, uh, what they understand uh, occurred. And, uh, but if we, we did it as a, as a council workshop or a council process, I'm afraid it would give the impression that it was following the requirements of evidence that, that you have in a, a provincial case and it just it just doesn't. Uh, and so uh, it would be a challenge to host it as a workshop topic. It would be very different from the workshop topics we have, which are used to help to uh, wordsmith and better understand different pieces of legislation. Uh, I, I don't I can't think of a situation where a workshop was used to to uh, you know uh, air different members of council's opinions or or, or recollections of of a particular event. So it's a it's an odd tool to use to do that. Uh, I think what I would encourage people is if they have questions about the matter and they want to address it in a public fashion, that they uh, that they are welcome to, um, you know, use the different channels available to them to share their concerns. I just don't think that the council table is the appropriate place for it. Uh, Councillor Back. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, Councillor. Yes. Sorry, Councillor Back. Councillor Kern actually still had some time. Councillor Kern. Right. That didn't answer, but did answer my question. Thank you. Councillor Beck? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have too much of a comment other than to say, you know, that this all did uh, result, come about as a result of, of uh, the actions of, of members of our council. And it, it's been a very long... Sorry, sorry Councillor Beck, I'm just going to interrupt you for just a second. Yeah. The provision that we're talking about here today came from Councillor Hansen's motion on... on uh, uh, contributions. Uh, for some reason, members of council seem to think that that what we're talking about tonight is a result of the. Oh, uh, your worship! I'm talking about the Luca Dellis report specifically. The Luca Dellis report, which this came out of as as a recommendation of that report. It's, but that's not in this recommendation. Okay. Tonight we're talking about the code of ethics as it came from Councillor Hansen's motion on on contributions. Sorry, Councillor Back. Sorry to interrupt. I just had heard a couple of councillors. No. suggest that we were talking about this tonight because of the Luca Dellis report. We're largely talking about this tonight because Councillor Hansen uh, put forward a motion to talk about this as a result of campaign. Well, I do think it was partly because of the Luca Dellis report, but that's fine. I, I can accept that uh, response. And I would just say that I, I would appreciate a chance to speak more openly about some of the content of that report as, as Councillor Curran and Councillor Bond have said as well. Um, and specific to this uh, report here tonight and campaign contributions, we've had several wow. opportunities to talk about it. I, I think it's still somewhat problematic in terms of how it's going to be um, enforced. I'm, I'm absolutely happy to disclose uh, any campaign contributions, but again, it's, it's a matter that you said the, the province has, has done their best so far to deal with. Um, but I, you know, I, I can appreciate the spirit of it for sure, but as, as Councillor Bond uh, pointed out, I think quite rightly, there's influence comes in all sorts of different ways. So this will be interesting to see how, how it plays out as a policy. But um, just in terms of the first point, I, I would support, you know, a workshop around uh, some of the other contents of that report. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Stewart, your response? Uh, you, your Worship, the original report that went to Council uh, arose from the Luca Dallas recommendations. The focus of the discussion with council at that point was not on uh, anything but the, the lack of clarity around this campaign contributions. And so therefore we've made those, those changes. So it wouldn't be fair to say that uh, this didn't originally arise from the Luca Dell's report. We've updated the code of ethics. One of those was to incorporate Councillor Hansen's uh, recommendations, uh, which council supported around campaign uh, contributions. And if council wants to have another discussion, perhaps in uh, a workshop or whatever, um, we could we could do that. There's no question. Um, I, I just uh, I, again would would uh, would counsel that we be very careful to council with respect uh, to those discussions because of the potential legal ramifications. But I, I just want to reinforce this came about. I'm, I'm trying to clean up the Luca Dell's recommendations. I've got two out of three. Uh, hopefully done at this point. Uh, if council wants to talk about a particular aspect, uh, then we'll give you some uh, legal advice as to what you can or can't say, and then uh, that's going to be up to council. But uh, this is this is really just dealing with the code of ethics, 
the changes that we proposed and the cleanup we made around campaign contributions, which again reflects uh, a council resolution. Thank you. Uh, thank you for clarifying that, Mr. Stewart. And, and you're right, there's two portions of this, which is the rescission of, of the, um, the two policies that pertains to Luca Dallas, but those when they're replaced will be a separate discussion. Uh, Councillor Hansen's motion actually came in before the Luca Dallas report. My recollection is your, your original came in in the fall of 2018, almost exactly following the election, was the first recommendation from Councillor Hansen that we review the code of ethics with the intent of putting limits in place uh, or, or proactive disclosure of campaign contributions when it when it affects decisions. And so I thought it predated the Luca Dallas report. Maybe they were in sync. I'm not certain. Councillor Bond. Okay, just to be clear, are there any changes to the code of ethics other than deleting some old clauses that are actually resulting from the events that led to the passing of the pigeon bylaw and were outlined as findings of fact in the Luca Dellis report? The only piece that is proposed for addition is point is 9.4 at this time and 9.4 does not refer to items around the Luca Dellis report. Okay, so no but changes. Pieces, but the two pieces that are promoted that are up for rescission tonight will be replaced in accordance with the recommendations of the Luca Dellis report. And so there's two elements tonight. There's the addition of 9.4 in the Code of Ethics, and there's the rescission of the two older um, corporate policies around uh, uh, legal uh, coverage for counselors and, and such. When those come back to be replaced with new policy, then, then I would say that meets that test that you're talking about, Council Bond, that their intent was to meet the recommendations of the Luca Dallas Act. But 9.4 on its own, I would say is almost is entirely in response to Councillor Hansen's uh, motion. Okay, well, I, I'll just re-echo my point and say that it's April of 2022. Um, we're going to break for the summer in less than three months. Uh, I think that events that lay, led to the passing of the uh, pigeon prohibition bylaw uh, were very serious. And council hasn't had a, a chance to discuss them. And the community, other than us releasing a, a report, a public report, and not being able to talk about it, which seems completely strange because it's public, you can read it. I could probably read it right here and not be in any type of legal situation uh, um, or need any legal advice to read something that's on our website. Yeah. Uh, I think we just need to understand clearly what changes are being made to district policies and processes, whether that's the code of ethics, whether that's the way in which counselors uh, obtain legal advice, um, whether that's uh, other things that are recommendations that are made in the Luca Dellis report. We need to understand very clearly what changes are gonna be made to our processes and our policies so that something like that is very less likely or not likely to occur again. And I wanna know when that is because we don't have much time before the end of this council's term. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Timelines on implementation of Luca Dellis recommendations? Yeah, Your Worship, I, I, I would suggest that, that we go to a workshop and I can outline um, recommendation by recommendation what action we've taken because we've taken a lot of action. A lot of the action that was recommended by Luca Dellis could be done administratively. There's a few of them that have to be approved by council. This is one of them. Yeah, and, and again, my only concern about the workshop being the, the place for that is two members of our council could become in conflict as we have that discussion at a council table. Uh, if, if you, if Councilor Bond wants to share his concerns and he wants to go to the newspaper, wants to put on social media, wants to share his story, he's welcome to do that. But if we have a council workshop on policy going forward and two members of our council can be conflicted out in the process, I don't think that that's uh, what people expect. Um, and so uh, you, you're right, absolutely. You can you can read out the Luca Dallas report in public and there, that, that would put you in conflict with the, the District of North Vancouver's interests. Uh, where the line is drawn is on the disclosure of in-camera um, discussions. And uh, and also, I, I don't think it's fair to have a discussion going forward, setting the policy going forward, and, intent, and incidentally create a situation where two of the five members of council aren't allowed to participate in the discussion. I don't think that would be constructive either. Councillor Bond? No, it's fine. We'll We'll see what happens. Okay. 
Okay, Council, I see no further hands at this time. So I'm going to call the question on the recommendation. All those in favor? Contrary minded? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay, the next item up for discussion is the business license for Flying Fish Child Care Center. And uh, this is returning from a public information meeting. I want to characterize that correctly a public meeting. When we do the public meetings, we treat them very similarly to a public hearing. And so um, uh, it, it, this is the first opportunity Council's having to really publicly discuss uh, this particular uh, issue. Uh, I'm going to first look for, is there any member of Council wishing to make a motion? Okay, I've got Councillor Hanson, second by Councillor Bond, if that's all right. Okay, Councillor Hanson, your comments? The amendments uh, to the flying fish child care business license to increase the child care capacity from eight to 18 children. This will provide 10 extra child care spaces for children 30 months to five years of age and thereby provide much needed child care space. At the public meeting and in correspondence received, the only concerns are related to traffic and parking. I note that the applicant has done their best to address these issues and will seek to have staggered times for drop off and pick up of the children. I also note concerns were expressed about noise in residential areas. In my view, the need for childcare in the district overrides the concerns with respect to traffic, parking and noise of the playing children. I believe this to be a suitable location for childcare. The applicants have a good reputation as child care providers, and I'm pleased uh, to support the staff recommendation in order to create these extra 10 child care spaces. And I'd like to thank everyone involved uh, in bringing this matter forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Councillor Bond is the second of your comments. Thanks, Mayor Lotto. I think Councillor Hansen has done an excellent job summarizing the input that was heard at the public meeting, as well as the details of the application. This proposed increase to the child care license is, and the location is right beside an existing elementary school. And for anyone that has young kids that are transitioning from preschool or daycare uh, uh, with some in, in elementary school, the convenience of having both side by side is is outstanding. Uh, I know my personal experience, I have about a 10 minute bike ride between school and, and preschool, but uh, you know, saving, saving an extra 10 or 20 minutes every day, uh, especially for a young family or, or parents uh, makes, makes a world of difference. And so I think adding some more childcare uh, spots at this location uh, is going to go a long way uh, to help some families and their children have a, a little bit easier transition in the in those tough school mornings and i note that the applicant has done a number of things to address the concerns of the community Councillor hansen uh, mentioned the parking specifically they have different plans around noise specific and you know taking the kids not not just in the backyard but out to all the wonderful parks and the natural areas that are close to um, the the school and the uh, daycare location there so uh, i'm pleased to support this uh, thank you very much, Councillor Bond. Um, I, I'm also in support of this, although I wanted to clarify something with staff first, just checking in. Is Jessica Lee on the call? Oh. Yep, I'm here. Uh, welcome. I'm just wondering, you know, it says in on page 487 of the main package, page three of the report, it, it has a paragraph about noise. It says use of the facility's outdoor play area will be restricted to one hour twice a day and the children will be separated into two groups during outdoor playtimes to reduce noise and impacts. Now that's in the report, but is that actually uh, something that is um, enforceable uh, by the District of North Vancouver? Is this sort of a good faith, good neighbor agreement? Um, I'd have concerns about us being very strict to that because we're going to have days where it's pouring rain and ugly and maybe the time is short that day and beautiful and sunshine the next day and they do a little bonus time the next day. I really don't want to uh, leave confusion out there that, that somebody's got a stopwatch or they're, they're tracking how much time the children are outside. Um, so what's the enforcement tools for, for this? Is it embedded in the, in the permit? Is it, uh, these are just really recommendations and guidelines. How would you characterize it? 
Uh, through your worship, uh, the district has no authority to regulate the hours of outdoor play of a childcare business. And the currently proposed outdoor play times were set by the applicant based on uh, discussions with neighbors and uh, what best suits uh, the neighborhood. This is more or less a good neighbor agreement between the applicant and the neighbors to be policed between the uh, enforced between the applicant and the neighbors is that that that's what you're saying. I see Mr. Bilburn coming on. Is that uh, your understanding of the matter? Uh, yes, Your Worship. I, I think the uh, applicant proposed those hours um, at the meeting um, as a way to respond to the concerns. So they're they're trying to be neighborly in this case. Um, the important point they also made is this this won't constrain the amount of time the children necessarily outside because they can take the children to other locations that are safe uh, for the children to play in, uh, but won't cause the same kind of noise impact to the neighbors because they'll be off site. Uh, so we certainly don't want to limit outdoor play uh, from children, but um, this is just something that the, the applicant proposed and they feel that they can um, administratively manage uh, to try to mitigate the concerns raised by the neighborhood. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify that it is not a condition or requirement of the permit as presented. Uh, this is something that is uh, more or less a, a policy and procedure that the applicant's going to uh, best address within their own operations. Okay, uh, the next speaker I have is Councillor Beck. Thank you, Your Worship. And um, most of the comments that I would have made have, have been made ahead of me, but uh, I was away for that uh, public meeting, but I did watch the video and I have read the minutes. Um, and I've actually since spoken to one of the neighbors who at first was not supportive uh, of, of the application, but they, they are now. Um, and I just want to recognize uh, the efforts that the applicant has made to reach out to neighbors and try and deal with uh, some of the concerns that, uh, that they have. And as has been mentioned, largely around uh, parking and um, pick up and drop off. And I think uh, the applicant has done a great job of trying to minimize that with the the pick up and drop off times. Um, and as Councillor Bond has pointed out, I, I totally agree the convenience of having one um, one place to drop off two, two children. If you have an older sibling who's at Brooks Bank um, is great. So um, that's, that's excellent. And I'm very supportive. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Back. Councillor Curran. Everyone else has has said everything. I'll just add that um, I'm excited to be adding more spaces in our community because I know that that has been a need that has been identified in both our child care report and um, just out and about in the community. Um, it's something you hear quite a lot and certainly the convenience to um, school is really important. So um, I think that this is an important step and if you based on our uh, reports and our community there's a lot more work to be done and there is some good work happening. Um, and I know some celebrations are happening around for the, the locations that have received um, $10 daycare um, in our community, including Parkgate specifically. Um, so uh, I think everyone would like to see more of that, but um, it's nice to see some of that moving forward in our community. Thank you, Councillor Kern. And I'll just uh, finish up my remarks on this. The, uh, I, I thought, um, I, I, I'm really grateful that the neighbors did come out and express some of their concerns. And I think there are some areas where our transportation staff can work with the neighborhood to improve the flow in and around there. Uh, I regularly participate in uh, these um, uh, school area enforcement days or, or awareness days, I guess probably is the more positive way to say it, but where we show up with a bunch of police officers and bylaw officers and make sure that parents understand where the appropriate places to park are, which spots are more drop-off oriented rather than uh, like curbside drop-off rather than parking. And, uh, you know, maybe we need to consider uh, if we have time in our, our, our rotation of transportation staff and policing to include some of the larger childcare spaces when we, when we go to the neighboring elementary schools as well, just to be aware of it, that uh, some of those places are under stress with uh, uh, parents arriving uh, both for the daycare operations and for the school operations and sometimes a narrow window of time. Although I think most of the people for the daycare space in this case are arriving well before the school hours. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, again, uh, appreciate the neighbors for coming out and expressing their concerns. But I think that uh, uh, as was well stated by many members of the council that uh, this location just makes sense. It's, uh, it's where parents want the services to be close to the other um, schools and also that helps mitigate some of the some of the noise because uh, so much of the neighboring noise is already from the the ambient noise in the neighborhood is already from a very active public school uh, right next door. 
Um, but uh, uh, thank you all for participating in the matter. I don't see any further hands up from council, so I'm going to call the question on the matter. All those in favor? Contrary minded? Motion carries. Thank you very much, council. So, council, uh, we've had uh, we have a rather uh, early finish of our regular business, and so I uh, left to create an opportunity for um, uh, for council members and uh, Mr. Stewart to make any reports that they'd like to make. Uh, I'm going to uh, just lead off quickly just to say that uh, on Saturday, uh, a number of us participated in the Council of Councils meeting, which was an opportunity for Metro Vancouver to do department by department uh, updates of their um, uh, different operations going on between um, uh, that, that affect all of the municipalities. Uh, I'm on a few committees, but I, I, I thought the it was really good to get updated on the water committee. I, I don't sit on the water committee and they definitely have a lot of major issues going on there that I wanted to uh, become aware of. And so that was a good opportunity for me. Uh, and also the parks report was, uh, was particularly interesting to me. Uh, I sit on liquid waste and zero waste and so had been updated on a lot of those matters, but uh, it, it's really good. I believe we do this uh, every six months, possibly quarterly, but every uh, maybe every six months where Metro Vancouver goes through all of its department operations and, and make sure that all members of councils in, uh, in the lower mainland have an opportunity to uh, hear a report, but also ask some questions. And it was great to see so many members of the council participate in that uh, meeting on Saturday morning. Uh, Mr. Stewart, do you have any reports? Uh, Your Worship, just one for all of you that uh, experienced the uh, the jam up we had on Monday morning because of the protesters. Uh, I just wanted to share with Council, in fact, that there is a meeting with the mayors, the MPs, and the MLAs to talk about the need for another um, access to to North Vancouver. Uh, the, the Iron Workers Bridge is just not cutting it. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to let council know we are working actively uh, to try to um, advocate for uh, some additional opportunities, whether it be uh, TransLink and, and uh, multimodal or, or something else. But we are continuing to advocate for that with the same levels of coverage. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Okay, I see Councillor Bond, your, your reports. Thanks, Mayor Little. Uh, we didn't have a meeting of the Metro Vancouver Housing Committee and Corporation in the past week, but I did think it was appropriate to acknowledge yeah. that uh, the district's uh, site that council uh, pre-zoned and selected for submission to Metro Vancouver Housing in the most recent expression of interest was selected as the preferred site. And so uh, that site will be moving forward to further due diligence by Metro Vancouver. And uh, I think that's a great sign. Uh, the previous projects that Metro Vancouver has been uh, implementing around the region with their partner uh, member jurisdictions uh, are in various stages of completion. Uh, some are in construction, some are in design. And so we uh, are, uh, should everything go well, uh, the next in the pipeline for a Metro Vancouver housing project. Uh, one. Uh, type of housing that we actually do not have in the district of North Vancouver. We're one of the few municipalities in the region without Metro Vancouver housing. And Metro Vancouver housing provides uh, um, affordable rentals. Uh, about third, a third of them are rent geared to income. So that can be as low as shelter rates. Um, and the other two thirds are low end of market. And that's uh, a significant discount uh, off of what uh, a person might be able to afford uh, if they're going out to find a, uh, a home in the District of North Vancouver to rent right now. Thank you, Councillor Vaughn, and thank you for your, your work on that committee. Next, I hear Councillor Back has a report. Just a very short uh, report. I just want, wanted to uh, acknowledge my attendance along with, uh, obviously, yourself, uh, your worship, and a number of members of Council on Sunday, March the 27th in the Lynn Valley Village as we recognize the one year anniversary of the uh, Lynn Valley uh, Village uh, tragedy there at the library uh, where one life was lost and, and six were wounded. Um, so there's been a bench and a dedication as well as the planting of a dogwood tree there. And um, it was a very small, intimate um, affair, um, which I think was, was very suitable and uh, fitting and uh, the wishes of the, every, everyone who was directly affected by the tragedy. So just wanted to acknowledge that and uh, let the public know that that happened. Thank you, Councillor Back, and, and thanks for your comments on that event. The, 
is that when we started to hear feedback that uh, four of the injured persons decided that they wanted to come to the event, we viewed the event more as an opportunity for recovery for the people most closely affected, uh, which is why we made the decision to uh, have it be a more intimate affair, which would welcome people to share their, their story. And uh, I, I heard from uh, many of the uh, uh, victim impact counselors that were present from Vancouver Postal Health that um, that that was positively received by the, the people most directly impacted. So, uh, but uh, we do have that space now preserved, and for members of our com uh, community that would like to uh, go and uh, and recognize, observe uh, the remembrance of what happened in that space, we do have a bench and a dogwood tree. And the uh, the mulch that was placed in for the dogwood tree to nourish it and help grow it strong over the next number of years was uh, the proceeds from all of the donated flowers that came in with um, uh, in the days following the event. And so, um, some very thoughtful, empathetic members of our parks department and staff have done an excellent job of of continuing that uh, that process through. So, thank you for making that report, Councillor Back. Councillor Curran, your comments. Thank you. Yeah, it was nice to um, attend and to see um, other people there. It was a, a special event and I think it was received well um, from the, the folks who were directly impacted and others who work at the library. I sit on the library board, as you all know. Um, and so uh, I, there's still some more, more work, of course, to do. It's a long, um, it'll be a long journey, but um, uh, I think that was an important step. And I just wanted to thank staff for a lot of the really thoughtful um, work around composting. Um, you know, it was very, very thoughtful. Um, I, I think, it, and staff deserves a lot of um, credit for that. So thank you. Um, the I just wanted to give a, a sort of call out or shout out to um, the library um, social media if if people are on it because there's a new thing called the board book bite. So you can see um, what. Uh, board members are reading and what they're into and so follow along um, on that. The I attended last week, um, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities had a series of events at the Globe series, which was in Vancouver. I didn't, I attended virtually, um, but there were um, FCM panels around transportation, land use planning, um, affordabil affordability, in, in a time of climate crises and how do we do both, um, resilience and um, had some good takeaways um, from some of the panels um, that I was able to attend and will um, write up a little summary and send it to, um, I meant to do that because it will also help me, um, but I have some notes jotted down around that. And then, yeah, you all mentioned the Council, council of Councils and um, yeah, also just wanted to, uh, encourage everyone to uh, read the IPCC, the working group three report came out today. Um, there's three working groups and this is the sixth assessment and um, it is a must read. Uh, and I think that that um, came out after many of the FCM events, but just makes it all the more um, pressing um, to address everything with urgency. That's it. Great, thank you, Councillor Kern. I Neglected to mention at the beginning of the meeting that Councillor Forbes did give her regrets for the meeting. She was not feeling well today, and uh, uh, and and since it wasn't such a heavy agenda, decided to stay home, uh, and that's probably best. Council, I have no further reports at this time. Uh, if somebody will move adjournment, I will accept. Moved by Councillor Hansen, accepted. Uh, thank you so much to the members of the public that came out and participated in our meeting. Thank you to the staff that uh, prepared all of the work and reports uh, necessary for us to be able to conduct the meeting. And thank you to members of council for your consideration of the matters. Everybody have a fantastic week. Good night. Good night.